All right, good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7 o'clock p.m. Tuesday, September 8th, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are with us tonight. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. Would ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Here. Well, we have uh, several proclamations uh, t this evening, uh, the first of which is to recognize the 2015-2016 Durham Youth Commission induction ceremony. I'm going to ask Ms. Evelyn Scott uh, if she would come forward, please. So you want to enter this one downstairs? Or Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the Office on Youth Division of the City Manager's Office, um, my staff and I would just like to say thank you um, to our parents um, for entrusting us with your children this year. Um, we are very excited about um, all the advocacy projects and things that we have outlined. Um, we hope you are as excited as we are about having your kids participate with us. Um, at this time, I'm going to pass the mic on to Anthony Mitchell, who has been um, identified as the point person for the DYC. Um, and along with him is Eric Jeffers. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Ms. Evelyn stated, we are glad to be here and we are honored to have this group of young teens who are eager to start working for the Durham Youth Commission to bring some new initiatives to the city and speak out as the voice for the youth in Durham. Um, right now, we're going to ask them to come step to the microphone and what they're going to do is say their name their grade and what school they attend and then after that we're going to have them step down and um, they will um, speak on their oath of office given by city clerk and gray Let me show the, uh, video clip. Um, before we do that we do have a wrap-up video from last year's term we would like to present at this time just to show um, what we did last year as a youth commission all of our work for the 2014 2015 term has centered around our four committees the first is the scrapbook committee, which was responsible for creating the scrapbook, which won first place at the beach conference. The second is the advocacy committee, which created greater cooperation between Durham's diverse youth. Our project included surveys of Durham's youth at their high school and collaboration with the Sister Cities Initiative of Durham. The advocacy committee ultimately culminated our work with a proclamation at the May City Council meeting that declared the Week of No Barriers as a time to reach beyond stereotypes. The Advocacy Committee also participated in Everyone Matters Day, showcasing our individual identities by challenging each other and our peers to take to social media and fill in, I am blank. The third committee, the Youth Ambassadors, was responsible for coordinating our many service projects throughout the year. From bi-monthly trips to Backpack Buddies, where we pack thousands of bags of food for kids to take home over the weekend, to Mobile Market and our annual participation in Peace Toys for War Toys. There, we dressed up in costumes and handed out food and toys to local children. Last but not least, our Public Affairs Committee started a web series. Each episode was written, filmed, and starred in by DYC members. The series covered topics from Black Wall Street and the rich history of Durham to events and activities for teens. Outside of our committees, our regular bi-monthly meetings were full of presentations and activities. 
Josh Edwards from Budget and Management Services, involved us in the city's strategic plan. We were introduced to Durham Compass and volunteered at Kids Voting. We also participated in a series of workshops on safe dating and healthy relationships, taught by Sharika Dunstan from the Durham Crisis Response Center. In addition to our work in Durham, we also attended conferences across the state. At Mini Grants in Rocky Mount, we debated with other councils over which nonprofits should receive the funding they applied for. Then we participated in the Team Building and Leadership Conference, a weekend full of fun activities in High Point. In Raleigh, we joined youth from all across North Carolina to write and debate mock legislation at the Youth Legislative Assembly. And finally, in the Beach Conference in April, we competed with other councils, winning first place in the scrapbook contest. Next year, we've been chosen to host the Team Building and Leadership Conference and we can't wait. Finally, we'd like to thank everyone that has made such a special year possible. It's been a great term. Once again, we would be remiss if we did not thank the city manager, the mayor, all elected officials, and the departments who uh, reached out to us um, to provide service for the city of Durham. Um, now at this time, we will have our students step forward and introduce themselves. Greetings, my name is Tamonte Stanton Jones and I'm a 12th grade scholar at Hillside High. My name is Jalen Clinton, I'm a ninth grader at Castro Heights. My name is Tommy Brown, I'm a 10th grade at Southern High School. My name is Quentin McCree. I'm in the 10th grade and I go to Early College High School. Hello, my name is Melinda Jolly. I'm a senior at Northern High School. Good evening, my name is Maya Reed. I'm a junior at Hillside High School. Good evening, my name is Taylor Walker and I am a senior at Northern High School. Good evening, my name is Sean Tarapurwala, and I'm a senior at Hillside High School. Hello, my name is Eddie O'Brien, and I am a, an 11th grader at Camelot Academy. Hello, my name is Michaela Intrican, and I'm a senior at the City of Medicine Academy. Hi, my name is Ariante Glover, and I am a sophomore at Hillside High. Good evening, I'm Sarah Favre and I'm a senior at Camelot Academy. Good evening, my name is Olivia Simpson and I'm a senior at Middle College High School. I'm, I, I'm Isaac Atkins Piercy, I'm a sophomore at Carolina French School. Good evening, my name is Kelly Trainum. I'm a senior in the International Baccalaureate Program at Hillside High School. Good evening, my name is Atika Faison. and I'm a junior at Hillside High School. Good evening, my name is Christine Worcester and I am a senior at Hillside New Tech High School. Hi, I'm Lindsay Molina and I'm a senior at Durham Academy. Good evening, my name is Ashley Kim and I'm a junior at Durham Academy. Hi, my name is Ray Palmer and I am a freshman at Riverside High School. Good evening, my name is Marcus Lofton. I'm a senior and I go to Hillside New Tech. Good evening, my name is Carrie Shaw and I'm a senior at Early College High School. Good evening, my name is Topanga Parham and I'm a 12th grader who's currently attending City of Medicine Academy. Hello, my name is Priyanka Rainford. I am currently a senior at City of Medicine Academy. Hi, my name is Bianca and I'm a senior at Jordan High School. Hello, I am Julissa Garcia. I am in the IB program, a junior at Hillside High School. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deanna Thompson. I'm in the IB program at Hillside High School. My name is Jalen Perry, and I'm a ninth grader at Kelsey. At this time, we will receive our oath from City Clerk Ann Gray.
I need each of you to, to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do hereby solemnly affirm that I will support and maintain the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of my office as a member of the Durham Youth Commission. Congratulations. Okay, we just heard the young students uh, swear to obey the Constitution, and this next one uh, speaks to Constitution Week, uh, 2015 proclamation. I'm going to ask Ms. Fran Farrell, the Regent General Davy Chapter of the National Society of Daughters of the American Revolution, if she would join me. How are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, whereas it is the privilege and duty of the American people to commemorate the 228th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America with appropriate ceremonies and activities, whereas Public Law 915 guarantees the issuing of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States of America, designating September 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 17th through 23rd, 2015 as Constitution Week in Durham and urge all citizens to study the United States Constitution and reflect on the privilege of being an American with all the rights and responsibilities which that privilege involves. With my hand in the Corporate Facility of Durham, North Carolina, this eighth day of September 2015, I'm going to present this to Ms. Farrell for any comments you might have. Yeah. Okay, we'll go take a picture. Yes, well, let's yeah. turn it around this way oh, okay. so everybody knows this is the yeah. proclamation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Never miss a good opportunity to say a word or two, right? Thank you, Mayor Bell, City Council. Um, what I would say on behalf of the Daughters of American Revolution is actually read the Constitution of the United States. Actually look at everything instead of saying, I believe in the Constitution. Do you really know what it says? And when you read it, you must read all of the amendments because that's part of it. And as a little side note, North Carolina would not ratify the Constitution until the first 10 amendments were put in and they are called the Bill of Rights. So there are a total of 27 amendments after this 228 years. It's a fabulous document. There could never be a perfect document, but it takes care of a lot of things if you actually read it along with the amendments. So my organization, the Daughters of American Revolution, will have put posters in every school in North Carol in Durham to call attention to the fact that it will be Constitution Week. There is a federal law that says 
any school of any age for any age students who receives any federal funding must acknowledge Constitution Week. It doesn't say they have to teach it for a month, but they must do something. So the poster and the um, centerpiece in the libraries, we hope, will call attention to that. And we go to about six or eight schools in colonial costume and talk about the Constitution and how it was written. And just so you know, <laughs> you get taught a little bit, in 1776, of course, we had the Declaration of Independence. But it didn't have teeth. So we didn't have a means of collecting taxes or defending ourselves. And so by 1787, it was pretty chaotic. And so there were 55 men who put their hearts and souls into writing that document. And it, it's worded in such a way that it really is pretty fair. I would hate to think we had to write one now that would be good 228 years from today. So at, um, on September 17th, about 3.30, we and some students from Georgia High School will meet by the convention center and walk up to the history hub. And then at four o'clock, in tradition, we hope to ring bells and wave flags. And we would love for you to join us. But if you can't, you can ring a bell at four o'clock which represents when they signed that Constitution. And if you don't have a bell in those days, a spoon tapped on a teacup served the purpose. So happy Constitution Week to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. A little history lesson. Is Dale Matteo, if you would join me, please. <coughs> this is a proclamation that recognizes Life Insurance Awareness Month. And I'll let Dale introduce uh, the rest of the people that are joining us. And I won't read all of this proclamation, but it speaks to the fact that according to LIMRA, International's Life Insurance Consumer Studies, only 44% of U.S. households have an individual life insurance. And it speaks to the fact that nearly a third of U.S. households have no life insurance coverage, the highest percentage in more than four decades, and continuously getting worse, according to the research firm LIMR. It speaks to the fact that almost 75% of Americans agree that life insurance is the best way to protect against premature death of prim primary wage earners. And it speaks to the fact that Whereas 29% of Americans would like to discuss life insurance with a financial professional, yet three-fourths of American households do not have a personal life insurance agent or personal financial advisor or planner. And it speaks to the fact that whereas Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company created the Life Bridge Free Life Insurance Program to protect families that can't afford life insurance and to ensure that a child's educational aspirations remain intact if a tra tragedy should occur or strike, Whereas life insurance provides financial security for families in the event of death by helping surviving family members to meet immediate, ongoing, and future financial obligations and objectives, as well as emphasize your personal commitment to the core values of importance of providing for the family in this trying economic climate. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have hereby proclaim the month of September 2015 as Life Insurance Awareness Month in Durham hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and to encourage all concerned to be more aware of their life insurance needs, seek professional advice, and take the actions necessary to achieve the financial security for their loved ones. And witness my hand, Corporate Seal, City of Durham, North Carolina, this 8th day of September. I'm going to present this to Dale for any comments, and she will introduce persons who have joined us. Thank you.
Mayor Bell, city council members, city manager, supporters, audience, and associates. I am Dale Mattioli, and I am truly thankful and sincerely grateful to receive this proclamation, which is an acknowledgement that our mayor and you care about Durham. It is appreciative from us to those that support him to help him with his poverty initiative goals. What's in a proclamation? It's the sentiment and enthusiasm that counts, and I have that. I'm devoted to this for the rest of my life. In the Durham News, Jim Wise put in on January 29th of 2015 that the mayor says that 2015 is a year of action ahead for poverty initiative. Mayor Bill Bell said 2015 will be the, the year of action for Durham's poverty reduction initiative. This proclamation recognizes the month of September as an awareness month to value the wealth of everyone alive to address their life insurance for themselves and their left behinds. This proclamation is a special way to recognize an organization that supports life insurance for Americans, LIMBRA, the life insurance industry. My associates, Teresa Robinson, Henry Pittman, and Demetrius Harvey, to name a few of my associates, so that we can continue to educate families and all of us alive. <laughs> because you can't get it when you aren't alive, of course. So I want to thank you for your prayers and your support. And I am very enthusiastic about making a big difference in Durham. And when the mayor spoke about the Mass Mutual Life Bridge Free Life Insurance, this is a program, and it's the only major company that's paying the premiums for eligible poverty parents for their children to get $50,000 of free educational monies if they die. So there's more details that you can get on my website, but this is what I'm doing voluntary. No commissions, nothing but just prayers and my dear God. So I wanna thank you for your support. Pray for me. My goal is to get at least 100 families done in Durham by the end of this year. Thank you very much. Well, Steve, that's another thing you can add to your finance committee. <laughs> That's Ms. Dorothy Smith. Oh, fine. I'm the volunteer coordinator for National Alliance of Mental Health Illness in Durham, and Mr. Thomas, chairman of the Durham Recovery Celebration Planning Committee. Come on up. Uh, the proclamation reads: Whereas behavioral health is an essential part of health and one's overall wellness. Whereas prevention of mental and of substance use disorders works, treatment is effective and people recover in our area and around the nation. Whereas preventing and overcoming mental and or substance use disorders is essential to achieving healthy lifestyles, both physically and emotionally. And whereas we must encourage relatives and friends of people with mental and or substance use disorders to implement preventive measures, recognize the signs of a problem, and guide those in need to appropriate treatment and recovery support services and whereas in 2013, over 609,000 state residents experienced mental illness and over 639,000 residents abused alcohol, substance, and our prescription drugs, according to the North Carolina Center for Public Policy Research. However, the same report indicates that only 52% of individuals with mental illness and 12% of individuals abusing substance sought help due to the shame and stigma attached to behavioral disorders. Given the serious nature of this public health problem, we must continue to reach out to those who need help. And whereas given that an estimated 1.3 million people in the state of North Carolina are affected by these conditions, whereas to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, 
the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the Durham County Criminal Justice Resource Center invite all residents of Durham to participate in National Recovery Month. And now, therefore, I, William P. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have proclaim September 2015 as National Recovery Month in Durham and hereby urge all the citizens to take special note of this observance and witness my hand, Corpus Hill, the City of Durham, North Carolina, this eighth day of September 2015. I'm going to present this for any comments that you may have. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bell and, and City Council. I am, uh, have been years and years in support in NAMI, working for those people with mental ill and, and their families. And I am very pleased to have uh, Mr. Robert Thomas talk to you about our uh, recovery celebration, which we are going to have in, uh, in this city uh, soon. And I wanted to say especially thanks to Mayor Barrel for his work with the housing, because housing is one of the three stools that really is a support for those people who are in recovery from mental illness and from substance abuse. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Dorothy. And uh, yes, this is our third year of uh, promoting uh, recovery in Durham. <clears throat> we have a recovery celebration coming up on September 19th. That's a Saturday at the Criminal Justice Resource Center, which is right on East Main Street, 326 East Main. We'll be there from 3 to 8 p.m. to promote recovery from uh, behavioral disorders. And how can we not support recovery? When we consider the devastation that occurs with individuals, families, neighborhoods, communities, we must support recovery. Um, I think this year's um, theme is visible, vocal, and valuable, the theme from SAMHSA. And to me, that means that people are more willing to come forward now and say, please don't judge me by my disability. Please consider that I am a complete person, not just a diagnosis, that I'm a, a husband, a wife, a family member, I work, I vote, I have hobbies, I have likes and dislikes just like everyone else. So we find that by having events like this where people can actually talk to people in recovery, we want people who are interested in maybe making that first step into recovery, people who support recovery, all to come together and celebrate the fact that yes, in Durham, North Carolina, people can and do recover. Thank you. Let me ask, are there any comments by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before Ms. Fran Furrow leaves, I wanted to follow up on her discussion about the Constitution and to uh, remind the community that this year will mark the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment uh, the ratification of the 13th Amendment, and there was is the Friends of Gear Cemetery, um, a location where there are people who are resting in peace who were former slaves. Um, will be The Friends will be holding a program in honor of the 13th Amendment on Saturday, December the 5th, and Sunday, December the 6th. All the details have not yet been worked out, but we do want to let that be known here, particularly since uh, 
this is constitutional week coming up next week. Uh, the second um, item I'd like to add is that it's uh, sad to note that the passing of a former member of this council, uh, Mr. George Nixon, uh, who passed away recently. So um, we've lost um, him and we remember the services that he delivered to this council. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Davis, I recognize the mayor pro tem. Um, Evelyn Scott has already departed, but I just wanted to thank her for the tremendous job she's doing with the Youth Commission. And this year, we do have money, some money set aside for delegates to uh, the National League of Cities uh, Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. They are doing some great work, and um, I want to thank her. Just let her know, Tom. Um, so, yeah. um, Del Mattioli mentioned uh, a program that she had tried to get started here uh, in city government that would certainly benefit our employees. I understand that there have been some roadblocks, and so I need to have somebody to investigate and see why uh, this cannot be something that if our employees want to do, uh, they can do, because it sounds like a good program uh, to me. Perhaps we can talk about that when we talk about the broker uh, contract in work session, because there might be some connection between the two. Thank you, sir. Other comments? I, I want to um, speak briefly about the Durham Orange Light Rail uh, Transit DEIS. Uh, and I, I, the reason I want to speak about it this time in our work session on September 10th, I know the council will be entertaining a letter to be sent to the Go Triangle as a part of the public comment period. And I've probably most of you know that there's a 45 day public comment period when people have an opportunity to speak in any fashion they want or write uh, any comments they may have relative to the proposed uh, Durham Orange light rail. Uh, there also, as you probably know, are going to be two public hearings. Uh, one is going to be on September the 29th from 4 to 7 o'clock at the Drummond Auditorium in the Friday Center in Chapel Hill. And again, that's an opportunity for people who have comments to uh, get their comments on the record at this public hearing session. There will be a second public hearing on Thursday, October the 4th, from 4 to 7 o'clock. That will be in the Durham County Commissioner's Chambers on 200 East Main Street, which is the old courthouse on the second floor. Again, it's an opportunity for persons who uh, may have comments or thoughts that they want to make sure is a part of the public hearing to get that on record. The reason I'm mentioning this is because, uh, one, I, I chair the Go Triangle board, but more importantly, I'm sure that most all of us have received comments, letters, and et cetera, of persons expressing their opinions on various aspects of the light rail. But what, what's important is that those letters not be sent to us as city council people, but it be sent to the Go Triangle board because that is the only way the public comments that you make or the letters you write and the concerns you have are going to be a part of the record. Uh, if you send it to city council people, uh, it's not acceptable as a part of the pub public input. So you need to send that to the Go Triangle. And I, I have the both mailing address and email address, and Mr. Manager, I'm going to pass this on to you. I'll share it with the council members, so somehow we can put that up so people will, will be able to, to see that. Uh, there's a a diary, if you mail it by mail, it goes to D-O-L-R-T-Project-D-E-I-S in care of Triangle Transit. And there's a post office box that is being sent to us, post office box 530, uh, Morrisville, North Carolina, 27560. And the reason that it's going to that is because that will be the official uh, receptor for any comments that persons have. So if you send it to somewhere else, uh, it's not going to do what you want it to do. Uh, you, can, you can also email it, and I'll leave the email address, but the email is info, I-N-F-O, at 
OurTransitFuture.com. Again, uh, we can get that information out for persons that, that need it. And the comment period begins August the 28th, and it ends August the 13th. That's the 45-day period, so we're in that 45-day 45, 45 uh, public hearing comment. So I, I just thought it was, again, uh, significant that we uh, state that in, in this public meeting. Uh, and I'm sure we have an opportunity to have more discussions at the council uh, when we discuss it at the, at the work session. Okay, I'm sorry. The, the comment period began August the 28th, 2015. And it ends October 13th, 2015. That's the 45 day okay. period that people have an opportunity to make their comments. And again, you can attend the public hearings and be a part of the record in Chapel Hill on the 29th of September from 4 to 7 at the Friday Center, or here in Durham, October the 1st from 4 to 7 at the Durham County Commissioner's Chambers on the second floor. So, Okay, let me ask, are there priority items first by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items this evening. Likewise, uh, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, city clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I just want to remind council that you have ballots at your places for the Citizens Advisory Committee and the um, Durham Bicycle and Be Pedestrian Advisory Commission. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will begin the agenda, and as you most know, uh, we have a consent agenda, and persons can uh, pull an item on the consent agenda, either in the audience or on the council, and we'll discuss that later in our agenda. Otherwise, I'll just read the headings of each one of the consent agenda items. Uh, item one is an item to be found on the general business agenda, and that's US 70 self storage, and I'm going to pull that item anyway. Item 2A is the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission reappointment. Item 2B is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 3 is the Durham Historic Preservation Commission appointment. Item 4 is the mayor's nominee for appointment to the Durham Convention Center Authority. Item 5 is boards, committees, and commissions attendance records for the period of July 1, 2014 through June 30, 2015. Item 6 is 2015 resident survey. Item 7 is FY 2016 agreement between the City of Durham and North Carolina State University for the support of the Triangle Regional Model Development Enhancement and Maintenance. Item 8 is professional engineering services for the demolition of decommissioned wastewater treatment facilities. Item 9 is the bid report for July 2015. Item 10 is a grant agreement between North Carolina Department of Transportation, NCDOT, and the City of Durham for the West LRB Creek Trail Phase 2 project. Item 11 is network hut license agreement between the City of Durham and Google Fiber North Carolina LLC. Item 12 is FY 2016 interlocal agreement with Durham County for the purchase of sodium chloride. And item 15 is the item that can be found on the general business agenda during public hearings. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with the exception of item one, which is moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Is it open? Is it working or not? Because I didn't vote. I voted yes. Yeah. And it came out no. Can you, can you reset it? No, I can't do anything. You're shaking your head. What does that mean? <laughs> you can't reset it? It's not doing anything, Mayor Bill. I don't know what the problem is. Okay, I guess we've got to vote by hand. If, if it's, Here. Okay. Now it's working, okay. Okay. It's open? Uh, will you close it? It passes seven to zero. All right, thank you. Uh, let's move to the general business agenda. Item one is citizen, citizens advisory committee appointments. And that's what we have. Ballots. 
ballots for. And likewise, have ballots for Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission appointments. Uh, item 14 is the Police Headquarters Complex Preliminary Site Layout Concepts Update. And while the manager's getting ready to step up to the plate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You have staff ready for that. Okay, we have, and let, let me say we have one, two, three, four, five, six persons that have signed up to speak on this item. So we'll hear first from the staff. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, members of council, Gina Probst, Assistant Director, General Services Department. Our team is here tonight to follow up on any additional questions or discussion concerning the police headquarters project since our presentation at work session on August 20th. We've provided additional information in your supplemental agenda packet arising out of our work session. Further, as requested at work session, we've solicited additional feedback from the Durham Area Designers, Preservation Durham, and <clears throat> Downtown Durham, Inc. regarding the five concepts we presented on August 20th. Our team has met with the Durham Area Designers and Preservation Durham. We have shared an alternative site concept diagram and a pro-con matrix that they have provided. Subsequently, the Durham Area Designers and Preservation Durham provided a revised matrix with additional criteria, and that has been submitted as well. Those materials have been shared directly with you, along with a letter from DDI. We do not have a formal presentation, but we're here to answer any questions, and I'll invite Deputy City Manager Bogue Ferguson to provide any other comments. Thank you, Gina. Mayor, members of council, I'm Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. Uh, just briefly wanted to follow up on a meeting we did have with uh, the Durham Area Designers and Historic uh, Preservation Durham uh, last week uh, to provide uh, just brief reactions to a, a design schematic that they presented that's in your packets. Uh, we summarized our comments in the uh, follow-up agenda items that you received over the weekend. Uh, I think the first thing we would want to stress is that we, we haven't done a, a detailed analysis. It's a design schematic. It's not uh, something that our uh, architects have had a chance to really dig into. So it's, it's um, the reactions that we provided to you and as we shared uh, with Durham Area Designers and Preservation Durham when we met with them are to a certain extent off the cuff reactions. They're not the results of a detailed analysis. Um, the discussion we had, and, and I know they're here to represent themselves this evening, but I hope I would represent them fairly to say that uh, their design is one that uh, primarily achieves the goal of, of maximizing uh, the potential for private redevelopment on the site. Uh, and it is not one that uh, we, uh, we developed on our own because we uh, approached this project with the objective of primarily building from the ground up for the program of the police department and 911 headquarters. Uh, and we also in the, the council's decision to select this site uh, pursued a goal of having a presence on Main Street. And so our primary uh, 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 concern about the schematic that, that's presented is that it does eliminate any presence on Main Street uh, for uh, the police headquarters in 911. And we felt like that was a design objective. Uh, so that was some analysis that we captured for the council in, in the memorandum. Secondly, I think you know, there was a general concern that it, it, it pushes all of the uses associated with the police headquarters, uh, kind of squeezes them mid-block. It does achieve many of the uh, purported design objectives that we discussed at the 820 work session, uh, but does so in a way that, that we feel we haven't adequately been able to analyze uh, how well how it may impact the the site um, in terms of the, the the program those are general reactions again that's not a detailed analysis uh, I believe uh, that um, the Durham area designers and preservation Durham would uh, would agree that that one of the objectives that that their proposal was designed to meet was to maximize private development um, and so I, I don't think we disagree on that analysis uh, it also obviously does maintain the Carpenter Building for private use, which is not a, um, an option that, that the staff had presented uh, where we showed options for maintaining the Carpenter Building. We did so as part of the police headquarters. So wanted to just summarize that analysis, uh, both for those in attendance tonight and to recap what we provided uh, to council. And uh, with that, uh, the design team is here. The staff team is here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let me first ask whether there are questions that the staff has of the council has of the staff and recognize Councilman Brown. Yes. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Bo. Can, can you, uh, before we get started on this, can, um, for those in attendance as well as those at home, can you give us a, a general idea of where these proposals rank vis-a-vis -vis the budget that was originally proposed? Uh, none of the five proposals that we showed on the 20th are uh, are consistent with the original project budget that was in the CIP. Um, designs four and five are consistent with the revised budget that was discussed at, at length on the 20th. Uh, designs one through three uh, would require an additional 3.8 million on top of the revised budget due to the uh, renovation and reuse of the carpenter building. Okay, again, for those at home, can you go back and give us the original budget proposal and then how much, uh, re of course this is determined by the po proposal that we will accept, but how much that has changed. The original project budget was approximately 62 million, which included you know, land acquisition, construction, design, soft cost, everything associated with delivering the project. As we, um, went through on the August 20th work session. We have updated our cost estimates and our new revised budget to deliver the program as originally developed is approximately $80 million. Therefore, we identified some potential program reductions in order to um, reduce that difference. About $9.6 million worth of reductions. And Councilman Brown, was that your last question? Okay, recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, maybe I should ask this question later. Um, I grew up in Durham, and um, I remember the Carpenter Building, and I'm trying to think back about what it did for the community, especially during the Civil Rights era just trying to find out what is really the importance of it. I know there's no uh, architectural value uh, for keeping it there, but I just need some help uh, trying to come to grips with why we want to preserve it when like uh, a mile and a half away, a whole group of buildings uh, were destroyed. And now we're talking so much about preserving this this, this building, and I'm, I'm talking about urban renewal now. So if somebody could just share with me the importance of this in the history of Durham as it relates to what happened to actually black-owned businesses, and now we're trying to keep a building that has no value and that will be even uh, uh, more costly to the project. Please help me. Do you know? Anybody that can help. Mayor Pro Tem, I'll just offer the. Just a minute. Oh, you want to hear that? No, okay. what, what I want, I think you asked a very appropriate question, but uh, unless the staff's prepared to respond to that, uh, we have people that have signed up to speak that may want to respond to it. Okay. Unless somebody right. on the council That's wants to respond. The staff, are you. Okay. That, that being the case, then let's see if there are any more questions by members of the council or the staff. Uh, if not, I'll go to the audience for persons who have signed to speak on this particular item. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, one question, I guess um, um, we mentioned from the staff that uh, we weren't prepared to discuss the most recent proposal. Uh, is there any estimate as to when there might be an analysis that you would make that would be presented to the council? I, I think we're comfortable uh, standing by our our opinions that we've shared I think what uh, if council directed that that was a preferred scheme uh, we'd ask the design team to to do an analysis I don't think it would 
be, be more than a few weeks, uh, but I don't know that we're, some of the objections that, that we brought tonight are um, observations that I think would carry through that final analysis. What that would do would, would be more of a feasibility test to make sure that the design as presented uh, could in fact meet the programmatic requirements. Any, any other questions? If not, we'll proceed to the persons who have signed up to speak on this item. I, I'm going to initially ask if you would hold your comments to three minutes. Of course, if questions come from the council, that's not a part of your time. Uh, we have Victor Peterson, Minister Rafid Zahidi, Zahidi uh, Ellen Cassily, Wendy Hills, David Arneson, and Leslie, Leslie Frost, in that order. So if you proceed to the podium to the right, uh, as I've called your name, again, state your name and address, and the clock is ahead of you. First speaker is Victoria Peterson. Let me just make one other comment. Uh, when I call persons' names, I call them as they've written them on the card. Uh, that's why I don't say Miss or Mr. or something like that. If you say Miss, I'll put Miss on there. If you don't, I'll call you by your name. Victoria Peterson. Thank you, uh, City Council members, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Victoria Peterson, I live here in Durham. I just want to just share $80 million is just too much money, folks. It is just too much money. And Mr. Brown and, and Mr. Davis, and maybe the, the attorney could help me with this. I, I thought when we dealt with the, uh, with the bull state, I mean, with the stadium, uh, the people voted on it when we did the uh, Durham Bull Stadium. I would like to know from Mr. Baker, and maybe he can get up with me later on, I would like to know why isn't it the citizens voting, uh, voting on this issue. Several, maybe several years ago, I came to this council pleading and begging you to address the crime problem in this community. The crime problem is just off the hook. I would like to see some monies used to get a handle and develop some good programs in this community to get the crime out. Where I live, I live in walking distance from North Carolina Central University. And folks, we've had shootings over there. We had a shooting on my street the other week, a Mr. Mayor. We've had someone come onto our property stealing Councilman Corey McFadden and Mr. Davis. I'm not trying to embarrass my people, and when I say my people, the African American community, but we are in a crisis in this community with crime. And this problem could have been very easily taken care of years ago when, when many of us came down to this council pleading and begging you to seriously address the problem and how we address the problem, we keep building larger police buildings, hiring more police officers. The crime continues to go up. We had police officers here Saturday. A person was shot down in this community because they were having a mental health issue on Saturday. That's the second African-American young man shot down by our law enforcement. What a sad, sad state and what we're doing in this community to our young black men who are in crisis. And Mr. Bonfield and Mr. Mayor and the police chief, this woman here, me, I'm sharing with you, I'm very disappointed in all three of you because you're all men you're all men, and together you have done very little to address the crime problem that is plaguing the African-American community. And something needs to be done about it. And an $80 million police building is not going to do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Victoria. Let me, I, I didn't... I know you directed a question to the um, city attorney, but 
the ball stadium was not built with a referendum. Uh, there was a referendum when I was chairman of the Board of County Commissioners to build a ball stadium, and it failed. But fortunately, the city council, which I was not a part of, chose to build a ball stadium, and they built it without a referendum. So I just wanted to say for the record, that wasn't, that wasn't news. And so the council has the authority to build the police station without a referendum. Yeah, so we, we have that authority to do that. Now, the cost is a different issue, but we, we have the authority to do that. And uh, since you directed some of your remarks relative to uh, the violence in this community, uh, to me specifically, along with a couple of others, uh, it, let me say, every day, doesn't a day go by that I don't think about how we deal with this issue. If somebody has a solution, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. And you should know, and I guess the public should know, uh, just for the record, and I know it just doesn't mean a thing if you're a victim of crime. I understand that. I understand that. But I, I can tell you that since 2001, since I've been mayor, if we look at the crime index for violent crime per 100,000 people, and this city is now 251,000 people, it is lower than it was in 2001. That's true for violent crime index, and it's true for property crime index. Now, again, that doesn't take away from the fact that we still have violent crime going. But the point is that violent crime per 100,000 people since 2001 is down in terms of the year 2014. Where are we going to be in 2015? I don't know. But I look at this every day. It's on my calendar when I meet with the manager every week. And if a person has a solution, or solutions, I'm open to them, including you. I, I said including you, but we're not going to do it here. We're not going to do it here, including you. Uh, the next person to speak on this item is uh, Minister Rafi Saidi. Uh, good evening, <coughs> Mayor, uh, Mr. Bonfield, and Ms. Creta. We are re I'm real familiar with you. You and I have sat down many days to discuss this issue. <clears throat> First, I wanted to say, I wanted to take a, a, a hint, because that's what it really is, from the Herald Sun, September the 6th. According to the Deputy City Manager, Bo Ferguson, he told the Herald Sun last week, the plans presented to council back in August were run against what Ferguson called a pro-con matrix. I want to stop right there. Now, I've seen the movie The Matrix. I know there was a blue pill and a red pill. I don't want the city to take the responsibility of almost $100 million, the way things seem to be going, and later on take a pill and have to bite on that pill, which will be a bitter taste to our community. $20 million, more than the original, have already been projected for this project. Yet, there have been no complete environmental impact study. I still call for that. I call for that because I'm calling out of the divine. There is something about that area that bothers me divinely. And I believe once you put this money in that area, God will show you what I'm trying to get over to you. I'm going to leave that one as that. Our educational system in Durham, along with the county government, is bankrupt to our children. Yet we can find $80 million to put in a, bill, a building, but we cannot seem to find on a moral status money to put in our youth. Something is wrong with that picture, that the students have to beg for money in this prosperous city. Affordable housing accommodation is needed. Poor blacks, whites, and browns are almost out of doors in Durham. A public housing just came before you and begged for $500,000 to rebirth their building so that we would have a place to live. But we keep on talking about a police station. <laughs> In light of something that sister just said, why we can't put that money in an area where it's needed at now? Our young black men are coming out of jail. One hour out of jail Saturday morning, Brother Levante Biggs committed suicide. Why? He had no mental health treatment in jail. 
A man come out of jail one hour on the street, 702 Andrew Avenue, calls his mother and shoot himself, but we have no professional, listen now, professional people in the police arena to handle these people. I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this, that my young brothers and sisters got to die because you don't have the popular health care. Trained professional people, they got to run in with guns. And I'm saying this and I take responsibility. The law of reciprocity is getting ready to come down on them. The law of reciprocity. Thank you. Uh, next is Ellen Cassidy. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the council for asking Durham area designers to weigh in on these schemes. Um, just uh, as a side note, Durham area designers is made up of architects, landscape architects, uh, urban planners, and realtors, and maybe a few other folks as well. So the reason why I say that is we really look at problems from all angles, and. Um, I think as it was presented, it sounded like we were trying to maximize the um, commercial aspects of the site, and that in fact was not our, we had two main goals, and that was police safety and good urban planning. And um, in reference to having the building address Main Street, um, schemes two, three, and excuse me, two, four, and five all try to do that. And, and I commend the, the design team because they've done a good job, but they can only do as they're directed. And um, there are issues with safety of the police officers that were brought up during these discussions. And when, um, when the topic was brought up of having Main Street be lively and active, the police officers were quick to say, well, yes, but, and, and it's that yes, but that concerns me, and I think we have an example of that with the substation number five on Rigsby, where um, it's neither an open building nor, it, because the police were very much against having those windows, and so we end up with a building that really doesn't do either. and. Um, and so really, police safety and good urban planning was really our main concern. And I do think, as far as addressing Main Street, because the Carpenter Building is about 30 feet tall and the new police station, I'm assuming, will be about 60 feet tall, not exactly sure on that measurement, uh, the fact that there is a parking lot presently to the west and the fact that uh, Elizabeth Street is such a skewed angle, it actually will still have a presence on Main Street. And of course, eventually, there will be a building that will be built on that parking lot, I'm assuming, sometime in the near future. And if that building needs to step back ever so slightly so that we can maintain a view from Main Street, these are really talented designers, and I know that you're up for that job. Um, so um, I, I don't know if um, the FEMA standards were handed out to you. It's a whole list of, of requirements that need to be adhered to, and um, having a, a nice, open, welcome space along Main Street is not, uh, does not work well with the security of the police officers. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Hills. Hi, my name is Wendy Hillis, and I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Durham. I'm here to talk about historic importance and ask, um, answer the Mayor Pro Tem's questions. Um, first of all, I do want to say that we partnered with Durham Area Designers on the revised, the alternate scheme that was presented to you. And while Ellen just focused on the Main Street presence and the idea of activation on Main Street, I want to follow that up with some discussion of the historic importance of the building. So to specifically answer your question, to my knowledge, that building does not have any association with civil rights history. I mean, I'm sure something happened there, but that's not, that's not the main story associated with that building. 
And I would disagree that the building um, does not have any architectural merit. Um, while the building is not currently listed in any historic registry, I would say that's more of an oversight. Um, Duke University is not listed on any historic registry. And I think we can all agree that Duke University is historic and has some great buildings. I have had preliminary conversations with the State Historic Preservation Office about listing this property in the National Register of Historic Places. It looks like the way we would do that would be a thematic nomination of the early 20th century car dealerships on Main Street, of which there are several. And in fact, the county housing authority, I believe, is in one. Um, as you go down the street, Fishmongers is an old car dealership. Uh, the old Studebaker building, which is now Respite. Um, there's a whole series of them um, that date to the early part of the 20th century, and they were really integral to the tobacco history in town. People came and sold their tobacco at auction and then were flush with money and all went to Main Street to buy their new shoes and buy their new cars. So there's this story that can be woven in. Um, I think there is some architectural merit to the building. Um, I can name dozens of buildings in Durham of similar age and architectural merit that have been successfully rehabbed and continue to add to Durham's character. Fishmongers, the old Studebaker showroom on Duke Street, the old social services building at 300 East Main, the old book exchange building, the Five Points building where the cupcake bar currently is, Mateo. Indeed, most of the buildings on Main Street are of this era, brick buildings two to three stories. The other thing I want to address is the idea that this would be an additional $3.9 million add to the project. I would encourage you to think about that from a private development standpoint. And if this parcel was sold off and led to a private developer, that developer could take advantage of preservation tax credits, 20% federal credits at this point, and an alternative building code. Indeed, with a budget that's $18 million over at this point, how can you not maximize your return on what you have available to you? My quick calculations are that uh, with the three things we have located in red on the plan that was given to you, the three sites, at $26 a square foot, which is what you all paid for that site, that's $1.4 million. Add to that the demolition costs for the carpenter building and not having to abate the carpenter building, and I think there's a potential savings. Thank you. Uh, next is Dave Arneson. Good evening. Thank you for soliciting public opinion on this important issue. I'm just um, here to endorse the Durham Area Designer Scheme. Uh, I think uh, Ellen and Wendy have spoken eloquently about it. Um, I'd like to read a couple things from the Unified Development Ordinance uh, that I think are relevant here. In purpose and intent, it says protect existing neighborhoods, prevent their decline, and promoting their livability. Also mentions conserving the value of buildings, examining the most important, uh, most appropriate use of the land, and to protect historic sites and areas. This site's in the uh, downtown design support one district, and when you get to the um, definition for that district, it says, this district is established to encourage intense development and pedestrian activity through regulations appropriate to the downtown area. Um, the standards encourage a vital downtown economy that enhances Durham's position as a commercial, culture, and entertainment hub of the region while increasing livability. The DDI is intended to work in tandem with the downtown Durham master plan and updates. And in the master plan for downtown, of course, you'll find all kinds of similar language about uh, walkable, livable, uh, mixed use, vibrant, uh, active streets. Uh, and I think the scheme presented by Durham Area Designers accomplishes all of this um, uh, in a way that's superior to any of the five schemes that had been presented uh, previously. Uh, putting a police department on Main Street, um, I would offer, is uh, probably the lowest uh, priori uh, priority of any of the criteria that are in that matrix. Um, there's all kinds of very critical, important uh, um, security concerns and programmatic requirements, square footages, parking, all that kind of thing. Um, but why is it important that the police department be on Main Street? What function does that achieve, or how does that benefit the community, or the police department for that matter? 
Um, we've heard about the security concerns that are actually in conflict with the idea of putting the police department on Main Street. Um, private development on Main Street would um, satisfy uh, the goals of the UDO and the downtown master plan better than um, a large civic building with a single highly secure, and appropriately so, um, public entrance. Um, I'd also say that um, not only can the Durham Air Designer Scheme uh, save the city some money by selling off these parcels of land, uh, clearly we're not asking the city to spend the 3.9 to incorporate Carpenter into the police department, but uh, you also don't spend the money of demolishing that building. You generate some revenue by selling the property as well as the other two parcels indicated in the scheme. Um, but there would be ongoing uh, tax revenue generated by these private developments. So that would be a benefit that would pay long-term dividends to the city. Thank you very much. Welcome, uh, Leslie Frost. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, I intended to get here early and write down an outline of what I was going to say, but as I was getting ready to leave my house, there were two quick pops that sounded like firecrackers, and as I got on my bike, I saw that everybody was out on my street, and so I went around the block, and everybody was out on the streets and the blocks, and there's a man lying at the end of my street who has been shot, and the EMS truck came up very quickly, but it didn't leave, and I saw them doing CPR, and it brought home to me very viscerally how uh, important the police department is to our community, but it doesn't change the reason why I came to speak here tonight, which was to ask the city council to um, reopen the site selection process and choose a better site for the police department, our police officers, and to open up Main Street for the kind of development that will connect East Durham to the downtown and the economic engine of the downtown, and that will, um, save the historic buildings that create the fabric of our city. Um, I'm sorry, I intended to be a little bit more eloquent, but I'm very shaken by what I saw, and I'm particularly shaken by like the two-year-old kids that were out on the street watching what I think was a man dying. So, thank you. Thank you. Are, are there other persons that want to speak on this item? If you could come up and just state your name and address, and you get the uh, yellow card after you've spoken, if you don't mind. Good evening. I'm John Martin. I live at 401 East Trinity Avenue. Um, and I've lived in Durham um, for almost half a century, even longer than Steve Shule. Um, so I have seen Durham, unfortunately, continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. I mean, I've seen some good, very good things, but I've seen some of the same mistakes. When the mayor pro tem said, why did we tear those buildings down um, a mile and a half away, I couldn't agree more. When I came here, the Biltmore Hotel was still there. Um, the Regal Theater was still there. The donut shop was, was still, still there. Um, the Washington Duke Hotel, of course, was, was still here. We keep tearing down buildings, and then a few years later, we say, oops. Why, why did we do that? And I'm afraid we're about to do that again, and I, and I don't get it. Please delay this process a little bit longer. Look into the proposal that the Durham Area Designers has come up with. They're serious people. It's not somebody coming up like me, who's not a designer, not an architect, coming up and saying on the back of the envelope, I think you can do this. Let them look at it, let, let the city staff um, look at it, look at the kind of possible cost benefits that we can get, and then consider the fact that we also want to make East Main Street um, more conducive to pedestrians. I'm probably the only person here <laughs> who has walked after midnight um, from downtown back uh, to up East Main Street by myself. Um, that's when I lived in Golden Belt. And it's not, once you cross Roxborough Street, you know, it's a little bit scary. Um, we can put some more businesses there, some private um, businesses that are uh, open. We can make that part of Main Street thrive again. And it won't look like, unfortunately, what the former Haytai now looks like, where we've got the empty Rick 
Hendricks Chevrolet parking lot where the Biltmore Hotel used to be. Thank you. Next. John, could, could you sign a card, please, so we can have it for the record? Marcus Jackson, Trademark Properties. I have the good fortune of representing a number of property owners along Ramser Street. I also represented the carpenters in the sale of the police headquarters land to the city, and uh, also fortunate to represent the investor group that just acquired the Hendrick Chevrolet dealership and plan to turn it into a three to four hundred million dollar new development for the city. Uh, I'm here to talk about walkability, a pedestrian orientation, uh, enhancing an area that clearly can be a uh, new source for our eclectic, funky businesses to relocate. That is what drives our city, diversity, eclectic. They're getting dri driven out of, in some cases, getting driven out of the core of the center city by rents and newer development. Uh, a lot of the property along Ramser Street is already starting to transition to those eclectic and funky uh, locations that I believe drive Durham. Uh, Pony Source Brewing is getting ready to open in a couple of weeks. Uh, I would encourage you to walk into that brewery. They have sunk a serious investment in that facility. It opens in two weeks directly across from the police headquarters. I have the Bud Piper roofing facility under contract to a developer that plans to renovate and redevelop that facility. They're not planning to tear it down. They're planning to renovate it and turn it into what you and what I think the city desires. And, and so with that in mind, uh, I, I do believe the city and its architecture team has accounted for a pedestrian orientation, but I wanted to make sure it's enhanced. That we talk about East Main Street, that is important, but Ramser Street is a huge opportunity. Keep in mind what I just said about all of the eclectic businesses that are likely to locate there and have already started to locate there. Uh, no one has mentioned that the Dillard LRT station is also directly across from Ramser. And so Ramser Street is going to become very important. I want to make sure that the sidewalk system around the county parking lot is continued around the police headquarters and the, and the tree planting. Also, uh, in a number of the designs, there is private development on Ramser Street. But I want to encourage the city not to make the same mistake that a lot of cities make when they build a parking deck. Uh, they plan private development against it. The private development does not come for years. So the side of the parking deck is this horrible, barren looking parking deck. And it's going to inhibit what you want to happen on Ramsar Street. And I've heard no one mention that. I'm not trying to add to the budget, but I think that's important. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. Are, are you going to speak? Yes. Right. Hi, my name is Tim Walter, and I think I'm one of the funky little businesses that Marcus just mentioned. So I'm with the uh, Reforming, Revitalizing Durham Fruit and Produce Company, which will hopefully be an art center at the corner of Dillard and Ramser Street. So I'm kitty corner across the street from the uh, police station site. And one of the things that I'm really sensitive to is, yes, helping to connect East and West Durham. And one of the things that we're not looking a whole lot at, uh, because it's not in the program that the designers were given, but if we think about it, our municipal govern governments will have built roughly 900 spaces of restricted parking um, in those blocks and no added nothing to public parking in the area. So as you're looking to enliven those blocks of Main Street and helping to get people to walk from uh, East Durham back into Main Street, um, back down towards uh, the center part of town, um, if you park your car at the police station or in the county health department lot and you go to your business there, you have to leave. You have to move. You're not allowed to keep your car parked there. So it's, it doesn't really add much to the street life. So I think where these private developments, our municipal buildings where they private developments, we would have looked to the, to the developers to um, collaboratively address a parking solution and enliven the space that's there. 
So I just want you to be aware of, it feels like you're building a lot of parking um, and feels like you're generating a lot of pedestrian traffic and people that may park there, but they really are very limited in their usability and in the, um, the street life that will take place in that area. So something to be aware of. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else that wants to speak or comment on this item? Not, this is not a public hearing, but it's an opportunity for people to speak if you have comments or questions. No, uh, just, just a minute, Ms. Peterson, you've spoken. No, you've spoken. Is there anyone else that has not had an opportunity to speak that wants to speak on this item? Uh, we're, not taking follow, we're not taking follow-up questions, Ms. Peterson, if you were expect, you know, respect, we respect the chair, we're not taking follow-up questions. Uh, I, I say a lot, I, I say, I, Ms. Peterson, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to debate that. I'm not going to debate that. I'm not, I'm not going to debate that. Okay. Well, I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to discuss it. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to the council. The question of what we build, where we build it, is what the council has to decide. I'll agree that 80 million dollars is an issue, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, having said that, I'm going to ask other questions by members of the council. Recognize Council Moffitt, and then. So I, I have a couple of questions to start with. I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Hillis, um, if you come back up. I'm I miss. I'm gonna follow. Up. I, I miss the the um, you you made a statement right at the end of your presentation on revenues at the city. My math. Hmm? My math at the end. Yes, if you would just repeat that for me. Sure. If you look at the three red areas that we have located on that plan, there's one of 35,000 square feet on Ramser, 15,000 square feet, which is the triangle on Main Street, and 5,840 square feet, which is the, the footprint of Carpenter. At $26 a square foot, which is what you all paid for that land, that's $1.4 million. Plus, not having to pay to demolish Carpenter or do the hazardous material abatement on Carpenter. See, are you saying you think the value of the Carpenter building is the land? Well, I actually think the value of the Carpenter building is more than that. If you look down the block uh, at 300 East Main Street, the old uh, social services building, eligibility building, that sold in April 2014 for $1.8 million. Um, it was a building that had been renovated on the first floor. The second and third floor were in far worse condition, completely unoccupiable, than this existing building. It's a slightly larger footprint, but using that uh, square foot number, I came up with a value of about 800000 for the Carpenter building alone. Okay, thank you. And then I have a question for Mr. Jackson. Then while you're coming up, I'll say, Mr. Jackson, you were saying that you've done quite a bit of work in the area, and I just wanted to ask your opinion of the viability of selling the Carpenter Building as is. Uh, you know, is it saleable, and would somebody buy it? And if so, in, in your professional opinion, knowing only what you know at the moment. Yes, yes, they would. Uh, uh, there is a serious momentum. Uh, and an investor appetite for urban real estate, and there's rapidly rising interest in city of Durham real estate. All you need to do is look at land prices, where they're going. Uh, you may recall Northwood Raven acquiring uh, the former Chrysler dealership uh, for $11,700,000 on 6.2 acres without site plan approval. Uh, and, and you all probably have seen the number, uh, the dramatic number of building trades in the last couple of years. It's just a huge amount of interest in the city of Durham, uh, and you all deserve some of that credit. You've, you've built a, a great vibe, you've got great momentum, so yes, it is sellable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilwoman Katari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say that um, actually I started this process preferring building on the current police headquarters site, but that is water under the bridge. So given that, um, regarding development on the Main Street site, I have a few questions and maybe comments for staff um, in no particular order. Um, one of the recommendations, well, so DDI liked 
schematic four and dad likes the hybrid of five plus one. Um, but just looking at the schematics for four and five alone, can you talk a little bit about the differences? Really, it's just, it looked like building massing to me, but I couldn't quite tell, so I wanted to hear what you had to say. Good evening, Jeffrey Bottomley with O'Brien Atkins. The differences between scheme four and scheme five mm -hmm. is the amount of um, building located on Hood Street in scheme okay. four. So there's a significant amount of that building facade on Hood Street, and um, yeah, that those are the differences. Okay, that's the main thing. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> We're trying to keep multiple uh, things open up here at the same time. Um, let's see. Uh, can staff comment about sidewalks around the facility? That was raised by one of the. Thanks. Um, I think it'd be best to address that to the design team. Okay. The comment was made was whether s sidewalks would be required around the perimeter of the site. We would provide sidewalks around the perimeter of the site, correct. That's what I thought. Okay, and um, a comment was also made about surface parking. Um, and, and I believe the reference was really, the bulk of the parking that I think the gentleman was referring to is really county. Um, can you remind us how many surface spots there are not in the garage in the proposed schematic? The visitor parking for mm -hmm. the headquarters is, uh, I believe, 72 spots. And that would be public, is that correct? That is for the, yes, that's assigned for the headquarters. And so evening, Visitors hours, to headquarters. evening hours that could be used by other people, it's open access, is that correct? That would be up to the, the owner. Okay, thanks. Um, so I guess turning now to Carpenter, um, and Wendy, I do appreciate your numbers. I'm not sure where you got the larger number at, at 5,800 square feet at $26 um, dollars per square foot. I came up with 151,000, so I don't know what the additional part you were referring she to. She was referring to the other red spaces, I believe, on the site. No, I've got okay. the 35,000 square foot um, land along Ramsar, that would be about 910,000. The triangle piece at 15,000 square feet, that would be 390,000. But 58, I use 5,840 Right, comes feet. out at 151,840. Right. I thought, for carpenter only. Right, I thought I heard a no larger number. I you? added the three of them together. No, not on the 1.4, but the second time okay. I heard a higher number. Okay. Just checking. Go ahead. I, I can't answer that. That was when she drew a comparable to the sale of the building at the corner of Roxborough and Maine. Then she estimated the value of the Carpenter building at somewhere over $800,000. Right, as opposed to being raw land. Got it. Thanks. Um, so I guess this question is more to staff. Um, I know that we use that number roughly of $4 million to renovate the building and incorporated it into our design, but can you remind us what was in that estimate? In other words, if we were not using it and we were selling it, what do we think, uh, and you may not know, but um, what would it cost a private developer to renovate and use that building? I mean, in other words, the building needs work, is that correct? Correct, and our original estimate for 3.9 was if we were to incorporate some of our programmatic okay. um, space in the Carpenter building. The estimate of 4.2 was to return it to a usable core and shell facility, uh, a building. I'm not taking into consideration um, tax credits or any of the other things <clears throat> that may or may not be in play. Okay, I think that's helpful. I just, um, when we're trying to weigh all these things, yes, maybe we could preserve it, and yes, maybe we could keep it for, or sell it for private use, but someone would have to invest to um, improve the building. So um, let's see. The other thing I had, um, when we were originally talking about, well, some of the schematics with the triangle and or the land along Ramsar, if we were to sell that property, were, would we anticipate an RFP process or just a flat sale? I don't know if the manager well, contemplated it, it, it would, you know, that has not been determined yet. It would be, you know, consistent with, with the state law requirements, which could be either either of those. but to be determined. Okay. 
I, th I think for me one of the questions was if, and I do support the retention of the land along Ramsar for private development, I still don't know what I want to do along Maine, so I'm just putting that out there, but um, I do have concerns about if we maintain or release the triangle piece and the carpenter building, would we have any control in either case regarding design? I know people want uh, Main Street activated, et cetera, but once it's no longer in our hands, it's private development and you may not get what you want in that case either. And I just think it's important to put that out there. Um, and so I don't know if staff has any comments on that. I, I would just say, Councilmember Katati, yeah. again, you know, that would be something that, you know, would be determined at the time the property was declared surplus and, uh, and solicitations were received. Uh, it, it's possible that we, you know, would, would want to uh, put restrictions or, or require submittals that met certain criteria, whether it be the carpenter building or the, or the, uh, the, the, the property on the triangle. Uh, typically, uh, in, in my experience, is though the, the more uh, restrictions that you place on those requirements, uh, that's going to impact the you know the price and the values of what you receive because it's it's you know putting more costs on the uh, on the potential development. But again, that all would remain to be seen when when we got to that point or if we got to that point. I appreciate all that. Thanks. I'm just trying to whittle away at all some of the decision points. Um, one other thing. I certainly understand the concerns about the $80 million budget, um, but that does um, essentially staff is proposing that we reduce that by the $9.6 million Correct. in accommodations or changes. And it also does not incorporate what I remember as being roughly $10 million for the possible resale of the current headquarters site on Chapel Hill Street as well as Rigsby. Is that correct? correct. So, so there are additional um, savings. And then lastly, I just wanted to say to your point, Victoria, regarding hiring officers, our population has increased, and so we're always expanding police staff to accommodate that as well. I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, before I, I have some questions about the headquarters, of course, but I did want to just address a couple of the things that were said were by speakers that I, I think just need some sort of response. So first, I want to start, is Ms. Frost still here? Uh, it's terrible that you had to see that. And what happened in your in your neighborhood is a, is a terrible tragedy. And we don't know the facts, and you don't know them yet either. But I do want to acknowledge what you said and to say that this is, uh, as the mayor said, and he, he does, he says he thinks about this every day, and he works on it every day, and he does. And many of us think about this too. But I did want to acknowledge that what you had said and can understand how you feel. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, to Mr. Zaidi, um, the I also have a lot of concerns about the officer-involved shooting that took place the other night. And I don't know any of the facts other than what was in the newspaper. And there will be a police report on that, and we will hear about it. Um, but I, this is the second time in the last three years that a, a, a person who was suicidal um, was uh, killed by our police officers. And I don't want to prejudge that in any way because I don't know the facts, but I am very interested in uh, what happened. Uh, were, the, were, the, were the appropriate tactics used? Um, did, this, did this man have to die? And I have grave concerns about that and um, appreciate you raising it because this is something we, we need to know. Uh, on the police headquarters, um, so just to uh, put a period on what uh, Diane was saying, uh, we, we, we throw around the $80 million number, but I think we're down now to maybe $71 million or so. Uh, still expensive, but I do think it's, it's right to to, to think about what the real number is. Um, the, uh, to our staff, um, we, we're basing also this price on how, how, uh, um, the account, county participation, about $3.2 million. And so do we have a, a reasonable confidence level that this will be forthcoming? 
Thank you, Councilmember Schull. Yes, uh, we have had conversations with the county. The county has not uh, committed to a specific number. The, com the county has uh, uh, repeatedly affirmed that they agree to uh, a percentage participation of the communication center. Thank you. And the uh, and then I guess this is probably for um, uh, O'Brien Atkins. Um, the memo and what uh, Bo said earlier is the the steering committee believes that the DAD uh, proposal misses an opportunity to have for the project to have a positive impact on Main Street. And I wondered if you could explain that uh, that thinking. We believe um, that the when we say it misses an opportunity to have a positive impact on Main Street, we're referring to the opportunity to um, directly impact Main Street with our project. We don't know what that future um, potential is. And when you put restrictions, as we mentioned, on that property. So that, that positive impact that we're referring to is the impact that we control. Do you mean by process. that that you'll have a great building, that will have a great presence on Main Street? We, <laughs> we will have a building that everybody in this room is proud of. That is our goal. I'm proud of the Human Services Building. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but I'm <laughs> proud of it for our community, but I'm not really proud of the way it faces Main Street. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say about that? I'm, I can't speak directly to that design. I don't know that, that process, and, and so I'm not going to criticize somebody else's work without oh, come all, all the information. <laughs> Give it a try. I, 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 I'll, I, I will just tell you that we will be back, and, and we will share um, designs of, of, of our project um, throughout that process, and you'll have opportunities to have feedback throughout that time. Okay. Um, but, okay, and so... Um, Uh, the the officer safety hmm. issue um, do you have any comments on that uh, that vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, what Ellen Castley raised yeah so yes and, and we talked about this with dads um, Ellen wasn't able to be at that meeting but um, part of that is how you situate a building it's also how you design a building and so as designers um, we are given a site on Main Street and, and so we need to find the appropriate balance between addressing Main Street and making that active and considering the officer safety and, and that not only goes into how we design the facade um, whether we do if we it's glass is it bulletproof glass is it less expensive alternatives to glass that allow for some transparency there are um, transparent uh, GSA projects border buildings that um, weren't considered to be uh, buildings that had daylight or views, and there were inexpensive ways found to, to, to allow that to happen. So as designers, it's our um, responsibility to give you all the options, and we um, design appropriately. We, we, you know, we balance those needs. So tell me, uh, uh, so can you say to me, what would be the advantages, the important advantages of the building being on Main Street as opposed to, say, behind Carpenter and another commercial building that might be in that triangle in, in the, uh, on that property but behind them? What would be the... the Again, the, you get that day one impact on Main Street. Mm -hmm. So you, you get a positive impact on Main Street um, yeah. day one. I think the other opportunity is that you don't have some of those, again, when we have those private businesses in front of the building, yeah. that's not a lot different than having those private um, businesses in the first floor of the building. Mm -hmm. There is a little space between them, but not a, a, a great deal of space. And then where we define the property line between those things and the police ability to, um, you know, in, to uh, control their site, yeah. just become, it, it just begins a blurred line. I agree at, with at, at the front of the building. Yeah, I agree with you that the police ability to control their site and what's outside of it is yeah. really important. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, could you build a, a building we would all be proud of behind those commercial buildings if they were there? That would be our charge, and yes. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, just uh, having nothing to do with whether or not you're able to do that, which I'm sure you would as well, would you th do you think that 
uh, we talk about activating a street. Do you think that um, the, having the carpenter building and the um, and something else commercial in that triangle would would help activate that portion of Main Street? You know, how do you think about that? Just as a, as an architect. I mean, I can't say that it would. I mean, there's no negative impact on Main Street, obviously, yeah. um, as as long as that there is demand for that space. Yeah, it can have a positive impact on Main Street. The, the question is demand for that space. And then again, I, I know this is probably not your exactly your area of expertise, but I bet you know a lot about it. Which is, if those were commercially available, if Carpenter was commercially available, what is your sense? We, Mr. Jackson, I believe, has already said that he thought there would be demand for it. And, uh, so did Ms. Hillis, but let's just say she has an axe to grind. Um, I wonder if you uh, would care to comment on, you know, from your knowledge of, the, of, of what's happening yeah. commercially here, whether or not you thought there would be a demand. I think O'Brien Atkins has weighed in on what our opinion of the uh, of okay. carpenters. Okay. And then, um, which I think would be that it would be very expensive to it would cost three and a half million dollars to renovate for a police facility and does not have any particular architectural um, wonderfulness. Again, I, we've commented on that and, okay. and, and, and rather than, than change our comment every time, I, I just refer to our past comments. Okay, I can't remember your past comment. but I, I apologize, I'm sure they're part of the record. I'm sure they are. <laughs> um, and then, the pro-con matrix um, was interesting, and um, let me see if I can get to that. My, my computer's trying to help me here. Okay. Here you go, I got it, it came. Thank you anyway, Don, appreciate it. Um, the, this was sent on 9-1-15. Is that the most recent that we have? The, uh, the matrix that was sent on September 1st would have only been a recap of the staff's initial attempt to, to rank and populate that matrix uh, based on the alternative scheme presented by dads. Yeah. We, the matrix that ranks all five uh, schemes yes. was sent on August 21st? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just meant the dad one in this case. Thank you. I should have said also, I think, that I, I wanted to offer my appreciation for the dad for coming up with this idea. I mean, I had pretty much resolved myself that, and, and, I, and I do feel that we should not spend an extra three and a half to four million dollars on Carpenter, and so I had pretty much, uh, I feel pretty strongly about that. I, I don't think it's the best use of our money. So this is a way to help us out of that if, if we think it's a proposal that can work, and I'm appreciative of the creativity that went into it. So for those dads who are here, thank you. Um, on the pro-con matrix, the, the activating Main Street, and I guess then this is a, uh, a question for staff I'm thinking, although I'm not sure if architects were also on the steering committee, but the, do you, f the, the activating Main Street, um, pre Dad and Preservation Durham put a pro on that and, and um, the, st the steering committee put a con on that and I just wondered if you wanted to comment on, on that. Certainly, I think that it's a good chance to clarify that item and a number of items on this list. I think we, throughout this matrix evaluated the pro con about what we could control when we built this project. So when we talk about activating Main Street, we are specifically referring to what we task our design team to do. Uh, and given the fact that the scheme that we were evaluating in this scenario completely uh, removed any city imprint over what happened on Main Street, our analysis was that 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 removed your opportunity through this construction project to have that imprint. Uh, okay. We understand what they're implying with a pro, which is that private development may, uh, when it achieves its potential, 
may provide that, uh, and uh, I think we don't necessarily dispute that, but our ability to control it with this project okay. is what we were commenting Great. on. Great. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then um, one more question, which is uh, you had referred to some concern about compressing the site that the DAD um, uh, plan would compress the site and you had some concern about that and I wondered if you wanted to just talk about that in a little bit more detail. Sure, and, and I can't get too specific because I would, I would say that, that that is sort of the unknown uh, that we reference a little bit of uneasiness about not really having had more time to evaluate the concept. I think uh, given that the uses get closer together, um, they did, they were very diligent in maintaining our program. So I want to acknowledge up front that they used our numbers in building this scheme and they right. showed that to us. I think given the fact that um, there are, that um, the Carpenter site has a buffer around it uh, in, in their scenario and that uh, we haven't fully run that buffer through our security consultant, uh, they did use a similar buffer. So I, I think they've tried very much to respect our program and I'm not suggesting that we could not make it work. I'm only saying that we have provide a level of uh, diligence and review on the other five schemes sure. that we haven't here. And given that this is the least amount of the site dedicated to the police facility and its uses, that is something we would certainly want to vet before moving forward. And, and if, if that, that vetting would take approximately how long, just a while guess? I'm going to guess. put our team on the spot and ask them to comment on that. I'd say about a week. I internally, it would take a week, so we could get it back to you. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me just say I'm, I'm very interested in that vetting. I mean, a week is a short period of time, and if it was a little longer, I'd be interested in that too. So um, I think this has a lot of promise. Um, I can see why we, you know, yes, it needs to be vetted more thoroughly. Um, and um, so I would be very interested in that, and hopefully we could, I'd like to support proceeding in that way. Okay. Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. Let, let me, uh, to share my thoughts on where we are. Uh, first of all, I want to say, like Diane, this was not my preferred spot. It wasn't the old police headquarters. It was Fayetteville, Fayetteville Street, Fayette Place. That, that was my preferred spot. But for whatever, for valid reasons, uh, that, that went out of the picture. I, I think we also need to understand the decision this council has made. And the decision the council has made is that we, knew we need a new police facility. I mean, I don't think anyone on, on here questioned that. Uh, and so we proceeded along that path. Uh, we proceeded along the path that this was the best slot out of the three that were, were proposed, the old police station, Fayette Place, and, then Fed, and Main Street. And we proceeded to assume we had a certain budget that we were working with. And the staff has explained pretty thoroughly the charge we gave to the architects, and they pretty much were designing based on the guidelines that we provided. I wasn't at the work session when these alternatives were, were presented. Uh, I've had a chance to, to look at them since. And I guess one of the questions, I, first of all, I was not in favor of supporting saving no carpenter site for various reasons. I, I just couldn't see putting those kind of dollars into that building, especially when, based on what the architects were telling us, is value. So that, that was not in, in, in my favor, and it still isn't. One of the questions I wanted to ask is, has, has there been any offers for that facility since it's been, I, I know El Central wants to stay there, but has anybody else offered to buy that building? No, sir. Okay. So I, I, I guess I'm a little, to buy the building before we even start talking about it. The building's been sitting there long before the city decided to use that site for police headquarters. And I'm trying to understand, was there any interest in that building? Marcus. Okay, Marcus. Um, could you come to the, wh whoever's going to speak, if you could come to the. Uh... Uh, David Arneson, Center Studio Architecture. Sure. Uh, I've been speaking with a developer who expressed some interest in learning more about the building. They can't make any commitments, of course, but they expressed interest in learning more. This is recently? Yeah. But prior to that, nobody expressed an interest that you were aware of. Pardon me? Prior to this gentleman that you spoke to, had anyone else talked to you about purchasing that site or that building? No. Okay. Does anyone else know if someone was interested in that building prior to this discussion we've had? 
Ms. Frost, now you, you're free to, because I'm asking the question, so if you have an answer, feel free to come up. I think there's a difference between that building and that entire site. And previously, it was marketed as that entire site, which is the entire Carpenter Chevrolet. It incorporates, what, three or four buildings? So that building alone has not been marketed. And now that it's owned by the city, I don't know that it's in people's radar that it would be available. Well, I, I would tend to disagree with that. If, if a developer, somebody had an interest in that building, they would have expressed that interest to the owners, independent of the fact that the city now has it. Just no one has expressed an interest in the building until we came to this point. So I, I just haven't felt the need, from my perspective, that we should, given where our prices are, to do it. Ms. Frost. Um, so I did have a conversation with a developer who th said that he thought that the city had paid too much for the site, but that he w had been interested in the site. I mean, he hadn't bought it, obviously, but he was very interested in the Carpenter Building, um, and this came out. And I actually talked with another realtor. But again, this part of town is is sort of just, it's a, it, the momentum is going up for this part of town. So the fact that there hasn't been you know, interest in the last few years doesn't mean that there's not interest now. And, and the city's purchase of it and the discussion centered on the police headquarters, I think, has raised people's interest about what's there. So I, would, I, I wouldn't say that that would be the question, you know, has there been interest, but rather, would there be interest now? And I think, I think that would get a different answer. What, 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 can the staff tell me, what, what did we pay for that building roughly? I see you've got demolition costs of about $256,000 or $489,000 of selected them. Five hundred sixty-one thousand dollars. What, what what do you think we paid for that building? For the carpenter site, it was yeah. five point four nine million. For the, the site. Building. No, I'm not talking about the entire site. I'm talking about if we carved out the carpenter piece. We we haven't done an analysis okay. of right. of that. We can do a basis on what we pay per square foot, but right. we've not done another analysis of what the market would bear. Okay. Again, let let me go back to where 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 I started. I, I didn't see the, the early models. I've had an opportunity to look at it. Uh, I do value the fact that designers have come up with a proposal. Uh, for me, I would not be averse to, I guess I'm where Steve is on this. I was there before, I, before he said it, but I would not be averse to the architects taking a look at that facility as proposed to come back and give the council uh, their appraisal of what it would take to do that design. Uh, especially when you're telling me it's another week or two weeks to do that. I don't think that's going to make that big of a difference. But at least we will have had six models that this council can now look at with numbers to make a decision. And with that, I think nobody can feel that their opinions weren't given, <coughs> been given an opportunity to go through and express your feelings on this particular site. And it'll be back up to the council to make the final decision. Uh, I can tell you that the only way I support keeping the carpenter building uh, is that we had a private developer who was coming in and taking it off our hands, and we could guarantee that was going to happen. But otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, it could go. That's, that's a cost that I think this project can ill afford uh, at the dollars that we're at. So I, I would support where Steve is. I, we got, to me, it's just another model. So now we've got six models. We've got a model that doesn't have a cost attached to it. And if the architects feel that they can share, sure, Kevin. Only exception I take is that the other five schemes that you saw were vetted in terms of drawing them out. This is a diagram. We will have to go back and bring it up to that same level and then go back. So I, I just, I don't want to make a comparison that they are apples and oranges at this time. Okay. We can make them apples and apples, but I don't want you to say that they're the same because they're different at this point in time. Well, I, I appreciate that because that's what I was trying to understand. What would it take? To take it was it's the one to two week time frame would be okay. there. We'd have to get Len Lease involved because there was some cost vetting that would have to be done. We will have to mass out those ideas on that diagram, see if it pushes and pulls anywhere, you know, in terms of the, the square footage and things. So but I just don't want there to be left that they're both at the same level. A different amount of effort and time went into building those other five. Well, I'm not I guess saying what I'm asking well is, how out. do we make an apples to apples comparison? If we would have to go back. Right. We would have to do the same type of diagrams that we did for the other five schemes 
We would have to look at it. We'd have to review it with Lynn Lease and then come back and tell you what all that effort and was. And obviously that's an additional cost that Dr. That is correct. Going. I think we need to factor that into it also. Yes, it is. It would be an additional. It is not in our original scope of work. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Well, again, for, for a project of this uh, importance and size, I think we need to do as much as we can to at least satisfy this council that we've done a thorough vetting of the And we options. would love to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to be sure that okay. we understand what we're not comparing the same things at this point in time. Uh, I accept that. But again, to me, two weeks for a project that's going to be here at least 20 or 30 years, uh, I don't think it's going to hurt us that much in terms of time. Uh, if, in fact, you can get to the apples, apples, uh, please. Right. Uh, are there other comments that we have? Mr. Madison, I'm sorry, Councilman Davis. Uh, not about this, but I, I, I'd like to go back at some point before we leave here tonight. Uh, and I don't want to blindside anybody, but this community has had a lot of uh, disturbances over the last little bit of time. And I'd, I'd like to not leave here uh, without hearing from our police department to find out what they are seeing and what kind of discussion we can have about the violence that we've experienced uh, over the last two weeks or so. Uh, this may not be appropriate, and, and if not so, let me know. But um, uh, the issue has been raised by some of the speakers, um, and, and there are issues about past violence, and of course the uh, violence is down overall but the issue is this is on the minds of people here in Durham and if they can give us anything beyond what we've heard tonight it would be beneficial to me and I, I think you have a valid question and I, I want to hear as much as we can hear without jeopardizing what type whatever investigation is going on I, I like to deal with this issue yeah that's why I said then, it, then this is not the appropriate time where, where, so where we're hey, whenever right. it's appropriate yes so let, let me try to come back to where we are. Uh, are there any other comments? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. I have a, a, a few comments. I, I find this one of the more challenging issues that we've dealt with, as I'm sure all of us do. Um, you know, we're balancing the needs of the men and the women who work for the city of Durham, the impacts on Main Street and all the people who live east and west of this site, and, um, and the impacts on the community, and of course, long-term capital spending implications. Um, I will say that cost, you, know, you can't just say, oh, it's 60 or it's $71 million, because it's related a lot to the program, the uses, and, um, and what we're doing there. So in trying to, I'm very concerned about the costs, and um, one of the things that I would be interested in hearing a little bit more, I think the staff can do this. I asked them to do this this morning, and it, was not possible, but they've come back and said, in the, in the time allowed, they've come back and said that um, cost per square foot with the peer cities for the facilities they built, which I thought was interesting, but I, I got to thinking about the cost per resident, for example, how much did different communities, and of course it depends a lot on what the program is, what are the uses that are going into the facility. But um, so far what I've seen, on the little bit that we're able to put together, it, it hasn't set off alarm bells for me. What did set off alarm bells was apparently the first estimates we had were really poor. And um, we need to make sure that we have good estimates going forward because we don't want to have continuous surprises. Next thing I want to say is, is that on the question of whether or not we should have a statement building, should, should, is it important that the building have frontage on Main Street in order to be able to have an impact on the street, the building have an impact on the street? From the beginning I've said that I've been concerned about what this building might, the impacts that it might have on the street. And I know that the designers are excellent, that the firm is great, but I'm concerned about the conflict between what we're calling the need to activate Main Street and safety and security of the people working in the building and the site. We've, we heard some talk about controlling the site, but we've picked a site that's bounded by four public streets. It's, it's, it's almost, as, um, as open a site as we could possibly go for. So, I'd, so I'm looking at what, what's the conflicts between those issues and whether or not uh, in the DAD, the DAD proposal, they've actually pushed the, the building back away from Main Street. And for me, 
I think about what, what, when we go into a community, when you go into a community and you say, what, what makes this Durham as opposed to anywhere USA? And part of that is the historical context of what's here. So I think it's important to really look at the historical context, preserve it where we can when it's cost effective. So when we were looking at spending $4 million on the Carpenter Chevrolet building, and I was weighing that against our other capital needs, I couldn't get there but because of all the trade-offs. But if we could sell it, which I think is something that we should look at, if we can sell the triangle and therefore have uses along Main Street, which actually add to the experience um, I, to give not just something that's handsome, not just something that is landscaped, but something that actually provides uses that people want to walk to, to access, to use. Um, and if we can do that without it costing us $4 million, then I'm in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there other comments, questions? If not, then I don't know if we have, need to have a motion or is it sufficient? Mr. Mr. Manager, you understand? There's a consensus at the council that we'll take a few weeks and do some additional review and come back at either the 24th work session of September or the first work session in October. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the next item, which is, and Ed, we're, Ed, we're going to do yours after we get through okay. all these other pieces. Uh, this is a the general business agenda public hearings. Item 15 is a zoning map change for US 70 self storage center Z14 00020. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young with the planning department. I can first certify for the record that this public hearing item has been advertised in accordance with the provisions of law, and there are affidavits to that effect on file with the planning department. Uh, as the mayor indicated, the case is Z14 00020. Uh, U.S. 70 Self Storage Center. It's a request to change the zoning map designation of uh, approximately 7.55 acres at uh, 34 seven, uh, excuse me, 3415 East U.S. 70 Highway from its current designation of Industrial Light or IL with a development plan to IL with a development plan with modified committed elements for a proposed self storage center. Uh, the development plan associated with this request includes commitments above the ordinance minimums, including dedication of right of way along U.S. 70 Highway as well as reservation of land for the future extension of Page Road planned at this location. Uh, please note also that this applicant is seeking approval of a fence greater than four feet in height in the street yard along East US 70 Highway. This is allowed uh, by inclusion on this development plan in lieu of a, major, a minor special use permit. Uh, you will also have noted that staff and the Planning Commission had concerns about noncompliance with the comprehensive plan policy that recommends adherence to the adopted Metropolitan Transportation Plan, or MTP, and the Wake Durham Comprehensive Street System Plan, also known as the Collector Street Plan. Uh, the MTP and Collector Street Plan call for US 70 at this location to be uh, converted in the future to a limited access highway, and that therefore new driveway connections onto US 70 be discouraged. The applicant's proposal calls for a new driveway connection onto US 70. Uh, it is staff's opinion that text commitment number three, which is on the face of the development plan, uh, as depicted on the cover uh, sheet for the development plan and will be modified further by the applicant tonight, uh, substantially addresses the concerns regarding compliance with the MTVP and the collector street plan to the maximum ex extent practical. Uh, the text commitment does this by requiring that the requested driveway associated with this proposal onto US 70 be closed and that alternative access to the site be provided at no cost to the city, state, or county uh, at such future time that NCDOT converts this facility into a limited access facility. And staff believes that this commitment is legal and enforceable and recommends it be accepted by city council. Uh, staff determines this applicant, the applicant's proposal complies with all other provisions of ordinance and policy. Uh, the planning commission heard this item at their April 14th meeting and recommended denial by a vote of one to 10. I'll be happy to take any questions. You've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing is open. Let me ask first, are there questions by members of the staff? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, uh, Mr. Young, could you repeat what you, did you say that there would be a, an additional proffer tonight to commitment three? Yes. I, I, it, can you help me understand that again, please? Sure, so 
uh, commitment three that should be on the face of the draft development plan talks about actions that the applicant will take to ensure that the proposed access onto US 70 is temporary and that will be removed at such time as uh, NCDOT limit access limits the, the facility. How, how does that differ from what's in the packet? It, it adds additional uh, timing mechanism. Again, I'll let the applicant read that into the record. But it, um, they've shared it with us earlier today. And what it does is add an additional um, timing mechanism that indicates that the, uh, an easement will be dedicated to ensure the cross access prior to issuance of the first building certificate of occupancy. And again, that will need to be formally proffered by the applicant. Council Okay. Are there other questions by members of the staff? If not, we have two persons that have signed up to speak on this item, Ron, Ronald Harpitz and Jeff Bendini. Bendini? Yeah. Okay. Jeff. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Mayor, members of the council, thank you. I'll try to be brief as I know you're tired tonight. Um, I am excited about the new police headquarters and the amount of work going into designing it. It's not easy, it's like a church. A committee in the camel that was designed, but I won't get into that. The proffer, I was trying to figure out why staff, I thought after the planning commission meeting we had really hit the nail on the head and came up with a proffer that would be acceptable to be compliant with the uh, major transportation uh, quarter plan. I missed a point, it took, myself talking to both Steve and Pat today to figure out what I missed and it was a mechanism by which we record the easement a definitive date and so uh, paragraph three uh, this is the last sentence which access shall be used uh, um, if and when the access drive is closed such permanent access easement will be memorialized in an easement agreement between the affected property owners to be recorded in the Durham County Register of Deeds prior to the issuance of the first building certificate of occupancy and to run with the title of the property. Now, we, I did not draft this um, totally. We did hire an attorney. Uh, Jeff is here to speak to that. I think this puts a nail in the coffin for the driveway. We recognize it's going to be limited access one day. Neither DOT nor the city want the expense associated with closing the driveway or relocating it. And we, our client is willing to take that task on. We have multiple avenues for additional driveways. One is across this easement, and the other is the Page Road extension. When it's constructed, we're adjacent to it. So I think there are a number of alternatives, but I, I believe we've given you something solid that makes it compliant with the uh, comprehensive plan. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Jeff. I'm Katani. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, just to run through basically how this is going to work from a legal perspective, the applicant has applied for a driveway permit from the NCDOT. The DOT is offered to um, issue a permit conditioned upon Again, the driveway connection being closed at some time in the future whenever the, the highway is made limited access. There will be no compensation to the landowner um, for the closure. Um, the, um, the, the way we've worked around that is um, we've gone to the adjoining property owner from whom the cl our client is buying the, the property, subdividing the property out. That property owner has agreed to give an access easement today um, or at closing, um, providing access over that property. Our client will have the right to build the road over that property when the DOT driveway connection is closed. Um, or alternatively, if a connection to Page Road is made, then, then, the, then our client will have access to a public road at that point. Um, we've negotiated this agreement. We've, we've done this many times with DOT on US 70, on US, US um, Capitol Boulevard, US 1 up in North Raleigh. We've done this several times. Um, never had a problem. DOT is always very willing to work with us. Um, and we can put a covenant on the property as well. This, this, this covenant, this agreement, will actually be recorded in the Register of Deeds on the subdivision plat that's recorded. Um, so it will run with title to the property. It will bind our, our the current loan, landowner and it will bind future landowners as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very solid, legally enforceable um, obligation and commitment on our client's part and that, that runs with the property. 
and I'm glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mayor. I think my question might be to transportation staff or whoever wants to answer it, but I appreciate all the information you just shared, but just to clarify, the intention is that you will build the driveway now and move it when 70 is upgraded? That's correct. When, when DOT closes the driveway connection, at that point our client will build the road across the adjoining property. Okay, thank you. So to staff, I mean, I, I believe that we consider 70 clogged and problematic and not good level of service. So it's not just when NCDOT and or the local MPO, et cetera, get the money to upgrade it. I, I don't, I'm not convinced that we should be supporting any additional driveway access on 70 now, temporary or otherwise. Can you comment? Um, yes, Bill Judge, transportation. Um, yeah, as you indicated, every additional access point does lead to additional congestion. That's why on uh, limited access or controlled access facilities, um, those driveway connections are removed. The applicant has, um, I guess the existing zoning does not allow, uh, allow the driveway, which is part of the reason why the, the property needs to be rezoned. They have gone to North Carolina DOT with this proposal and they have tentatively, well, they have, I guess, indicated that they would approve a driveway permit with these conditions, so. And well, yeah, I guess, Ron, can you address why you're not, not necessarily not pursuing the easement, but why you wouldn't just build the alternate driveway now instead of accessing 70? Yes, ma'am. Uh, there is a single driveway for approximately 100 acres of land with 2,500 lineal feet of frontage on 70. That access point is used exclusively by tractor trailers. It's a lot of movement back and forth, large tractor trailers. We don't really want the general public mingling in with that. It's, it's a dangerous situation. When we talked to NCDOT about the additional driveway, we even acknowledged that their request is gonna be for a D-cell lane to be built on 70 to get our traffic. It's a right in, right out. It's not a full access, so it's right in, right out. And we'll have a D-cell lane that gets traffic out of the lane and into the driveway without um, dramatic impact to the existing traffic flow. I just don't like mixing the general public with the industrial traffic that really there's a lot of it and they, they travel all over the place on both properties. Are there other questions, comments? Recognize Council Moffitt. So just to be clear, and this, I, I think this is for the lawyer, I just want to be clear. When you said a covenant will be recorded, what you're saying is, is that a future buyer would have a record, would see a record that this driveway was required. Is that correct? Yes. It's a, when we record the subdivision plat, we actually put language on the subdivision plat that um, contains this, this, this covenant to, to remove the driveway and it, it essentially says you know, the, the current property owner and future property owners waive all right to compensation. Um, anybody that's searching title to this property is going to find that plat is going to be referenced in the legal description and that's how it binds all future owners. All right, great, thank you. Um, so uh, for staff, Mr. Young, I, I, um, this is actually for planning. The, the uh, report in our packet says it's not consistent with the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, and you made a comment earlier, but I couldn't tell whether you're saying that staff would revise that at this point or not. Well, by providing the new access, it's not technically compliant or consistent with the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. But what I intended to say, and I hope I did say, is that the actions, the commitment that the applicants clarified tonight is provides the most mitigation short of removing the new access to compliance and provides the best legal and enforceable mechanism to ensure removal of the access at the time which the facility is limited access. What does the current development plan allow uh, for this site? Yeah, so this is a 1996 development plan that allowed only development on the um, eastern portion of the tract of about a 14 acre parcel which is the trucking company there's no development allowed whatsoever on on the, the track that's before you tonight Incl including no vehicular access as I think mr. Horvath said okay. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Let, let me ask the staff one question. <laughs> Sorry, you gotta keep turning around. So none of this was presented at the Planning Commission, these proposals and all that? I, I guess I'm just troubled by the fact that the denial was, was as strong as it was by the Planning Commission. Did they hear the same thing we heard here tonight? The, the, com the committed element, number three, that you see before you tonight was modified tonight was, was worded differently and was much uh, less strong. And what staff represented at that time is we were, we were not sure it was enforceable as written at that time. So it was a, I would say it was a substantially different set of facts in that regard that we couldn't offer any solid representation to the Planning Commission that there was a solid enforcement mechanism to ensure removal of the driveway at the time of limited access with, without compensation and without cost to the city, county, or state. And, and you feel more comfortable with what's being presented? Definitely. It's much improved. Okay. Are there other questions, comments? Anyone else want to speak on this item? This being a public hearing matter. Uh, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter's back before the council. I have a motion, but not a second, so I recognize Councilman Moffitt. I'm sorry, did you say you had a motion, but not a second? That's right. Uh, I'll second it. Okay. And then I have Next a comment. Questions, all right. I just want to, uh, I'll comment on the motion that um, I, I actually was thinking that, that um, requiring the easement, the, uh, requiring uh, having the easement in hand prior to a building permit certificate occupancy would be my fallback and you've gotten there. I'm a little conflicted by the fact that there's a, a development plan on the entire site where it, we're severing off half the site by doing this and letting them do a new um, development plan. But in looking through the comments from the Planning Commission, most, I do see that much of the, as staff has said, much of the comments have to do with the issues around the access. And um, so although I have some hesitations, I will be voting to approve this tonight. Further discussion on the motion? If not, I'm gonna call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes five to two with Councilmember Katati voting no and Councilmember Davis voting no. Thank you. Uh, clerk, you have a report. Do you have yeah, a report? Oh, I, I, we've got to do these other things. I'm, I keep forgetting about that. Second. <laughs> yeah. Second. Uh, move and second, Madam Clerk. We open the vote. Close the vote. It passed seven to zero. Thank you. Yes, I have a report. Them. Yeah, the Citizens Senator Advisory clerk. Committee. Barry Birch received seven votes for appointment. Matthew McCarahan received five votes for appointment. On the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, Andrew Hudson received four votes for appointment. Thank you. I recognize uh, Councilman Davis. I I'm sorry, did you have something? I'm sorry, you may approach me or something? Oh, yes, well, uh, please support Councilman Davis. Well, since he raised the question, I I'm recognizing him. Well, I, I think the question is, is pretty clear. I don't know who would be speaking, but I just wanted to ask us to not go through this whole meeting and not have any discussion about the amount of um, violence that we have seen over the last uh, two to three weeks. Um, some of it um, leading to the death of a person by the uh, police department. I don't want to put the police department in a position where it has to talk about issues that may be more appropriate to talk about later on, but I'd like to hear something about where we are and what, what we can do um, from the police perspective. Councilman Davis, if I could first, uh, Chief Lopez is here, but uh, you know, the, the, there are a variety, many, in many respects, unrelated uh, issues that are have uh, we, the police department has faced over the last several weeks. Uh, we're definitely not in a position to speak at all about the incident Saturday. Uh, that still is under review. 
uh, and I will be meeting with the police department tomorrow to, uh, to review that incident and then uh, in preparation for the, the five-day report uh, that we, we will probably issue later this week, which is our standard protocol. Uh, as it relates to the incident this evening, I know Chief Lopez is anxious to get out on the street with the other group that's out there now. We did have a homicide while we were here uh, this evening. Don't know any of the circumstances associated with that, uh, but something that we, we want to, uh, you know, I'm sure they're uh, get, get some more answers about. Uh, but, you know, as you know and I know, when, when we see the Daily Watch reports, there have been a, has been a variety of, uh, of incidents, many of which are, are robberies, uh, not necessarily uh, people being shot, although there's been a few of those situations as well. Uh, um, and I don't know that we have answers for every one of them other than that, that it is something that is very concerning to the administration, as I know it is to you, as I know it is to the, the police department. Uh, and uh, in several of those instances, arrests have been made. Uh, the, the, in my opinion, the, the level of some of that uh, violence dropped back down after those arrests were made. But it is something the police department is, uh, is monitoring very closely and has, uh, as they did in that instance, when necessary, ramp up the additional resources that are needed to, uh, to try to respond to that. So I think if there are you know, some specific questions that, that uh, you have, we certainly would be prepared to respond to those uh, to the extent we can. Uh, but, it, but if it's a longer uh, uh, conversation about strategy and some of those kinds of things, it may be more appropriate for a, a little bit different form. But I certainly don't want to uh, um, you know, remove any opportunity for you to ask Chief Lopez any question that you have directly this evening. Well, here again, I, I'm not interested in trying to play gotcha. Uh, I am interested in making sure that we don't miss any opportunity to share with the Durham community uh, our uh, outrage and disgust with what has gone on and our any future plans we may have to try to abet um, or offset some of the things that have gone on. I, I also respect the protocol and want to make sure that we give the opportunity and the fairness to everyone involved uh, particularly people in the police department, uh, but I did not want this meeting to go forth without the council um, sharing. And sev several of us have mentioned some of those things along the way. We just need to make sure that the public knows that the city council is concerned as they are about uh, where we are as a city. Let, let me, I guess I, I, I do need to say something, uh, especially in view of my remarks earlier about violence in this community. My, my comments relative to violence in the community are really related to the data that's available publicly. And when I spoke about the fact, if I looked at the violence per 100,000 residents in 2001, compared to where we are today, there has been a decrease. That decrease is probably 15, 18 percent, a little bit more. You can look at the numbers. Uh, the same thing for property crime. If you look at where property crime per 100,000 people were in 2001, versus where it is today, at the end of 2014, I shouldn't say today, because that's the way the date is, end of 2014, is down. But I, that, to me, by no means di diminishes the fact that we've got violence in our community. And uh, when I say I think about it every day, I do. It's on a calendar when I meet with the manager every Wednesday. In fact, this incident that happened Saturday, and I don't normally go out to crime scenes, I went out to this crime scene because of what I heard and I obviously couldn't get into it, but I thought maybe if some residents were around, they'd be able to share some information. Uh, but I, I guess another piece that disturbs me, Eddie, when I look at the reports that we receive, I look at who the suspects are, and I look at who the vi victims are. When I look at the race, when I look at the ages, it tends to be 16 years of age to 30 years of age. And I was just thinking the other day, I've been in this office going on 14 years. So a kid that is at 16, that's in, he, he was two years old. <laughs> and when you look at somebody that's 30, that person was 16 years old. You know, so what if somehow we could have wrapped our hands around these young people at that age, at those ages, and somehow moved them in a different path? What would we be looking at? So I think this community has really got to think about it. And it's not just a law enforcement piece, you know. You, you got, we've got to be looking at these young kids out here. And what I didn't say, uh, the majority of them are African-American males. <laughs> so 
somehow we've got to find a way to, to deal with that. So when I was, I wasn't trying to be facetious when I said solutions, but uh, that, that's, that's where it's happening. And we've got to find a way, way to deal with it. And you know, you might not like the fact that I say violence is down and you just had, had another homicide. And, but I recognize that if you are a victim, it doesn't mean anything about the statistics. It doesn't mean anything. And I, I appreciate that, but it's, it's not just a law enforcement piece. I recognize the mayor pro tem. Yeah, and for years and years, you have asked the community, uh, individuals in the community, to mentor our young people. And how many of us have done that? So we need, the community has to do something. We've got to do something to help our people, whether it's through the church or our individually touching people. We've got to do it. The police can't do it all, and, and that's a fact. I've seen the deterioration of the family unit. Uh, there are kids who don't have hope. Their parents are here. They are here. They're angry. And so something needs to be done in this society to help change this. Uh, in addition to that, um, citizens must feel free to report what they've seen. They've got to report to the police what's happening in their neighborhoods. Anything that I see in my neighborhood that looks strange, I am reporting. In fact, um, something, well, I'll talk about that on, at the work session uh, about dog poop. But uh, I mean, you have to report it. Things are changing in the society and we've got to deal with it. We've got to deal with it. We have got to deal with it. It's, it's not just a policing problem. It is a society problem, a family deterioration problem, a lack of hope problem. And so we've got to touch somebody. Each of us has to touch somebody. And that's just my two cents. Well, first, I refer back to Councilman Davis. Is there anything else? No, uh, I, I certainly, just my comments were not personal at all. I I, and I'm not accusing anyone, certainly no one on this panel, um, of anything other than the fact that we need to make sure that the entire community recognizes that it is a responsibility for all of us. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other items to come before the council? We're adjourned at 9.28 p.m. Thank you.